Paul Rosenblum is a bookkeeper, not an accountant or a CPA. Although the information in this podcast comes from professionals, it's meant to give you enough knowledge about these subjects to have a meaningful dialogue with your tax preparer about bookkeeping and taxes. Welcome to this different episode of the podcast. I'm Paul Rosenblum. Today, we have a guest with us, and full disclosure, she happens to to have been a bookkeeping client of mine for about 10 years, Sarah Follenhauer from Sets by Sarah. Welcome, and thanks for coming on, Sarah. Thank you, Paul. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. So since the podcast is for small business owners, my first question to you is how you got started as a business owner. Was the light bulb moment? Or was it slower over a period of time? When I started, it was the late 90s, and I was an assistant. And basically, I think the the thing that kind of kicked me out the door was uh, September 11th happened. (laughs) And basically, I started freelancing. That was my first introduction to the freelance world. It just kind of happened. I freelance assisted for about six years on and off. And then all of a sudden, slowly, I was starting to get kind of handed jobs that related to set building. Uh, This was after I was pursuing being a photographer. So long story short, by that point, the the crash happened of 2008, I guess it was. (laughs) And um, 2007, 2008. So that really was kind of the clincher of kicking me even further into the freelance world and also being my own boss. At that point, rates were starting to change for people who were working previously before me. Uh, the rates actually got lower, which means my rate was higher for coming in from an assistant into being on my own. So I guess to answer your question, it was almost like a little bit of these gradual, all these big mile markers in the world that kind of gradually pushed me into this ebb and flow of getting higher and higher in a position of having my own business. Because once I started seeing that, you know, kind of being on my own and knowing I always wanted to be my own boss, it was, that was probably, then it got to the light bulb moment of like, yes, this is exactly where I want to be, be my own boss. It kind of answers my next question, too, because I wanted to know if you were kind of a natural leader before you got into self-employment. So I guess the answer is really yes. It was just a natural thing that you knew that one day you wanted to be a business owner. Well, my dad always said there's two people in the world. There's leaders and followers. And I find it so funny now that followers, the term followers is such a prominent uh, word being used. Uh, in social media. And that's a positive thing now, which I don't really agree with. But uh, yeah, I've always considered myself a leader, even when I was younger. And definitely, I have had a lot of growing pains into how to be a leader. But I find that is one of my strengths and, uh, and, and very enjoyable, actually, it doesn't intimidate me. And I love taking the the, the reins in a business. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very common with small business owners, because if you're not a kind of a natural leader and you start your own business, it's it's a whole different world. And people don't realize that. I think a lot of people who go into small business think that it's the same thing as working for someone else. It's about the sale and it's about making money. And people don't realize all the other things you have to do to lead people who work for you and to keep the company moving forward. And it's very different being your own boss. And if you don't have that natural ability, I think it's very, very difficult, if not impossible for some people who were forced to go into self-employment, maybe because they were laid off. Exactly. No. And it's one of those things that I'm so glad that I had the years I did of, of assisting and assisting in New York City, seeing the ways that people worked, watching photographers, how they worked, I photo assisted, watching how set people worked. There was a lot of things too, as time went on, especially with a lot of the set people I chose to work with, that I saw a lot of things they could have done differently. I learned of a lot of what not to do and how I would do it differently. I remembered as an assistant suggesting things to them, even monetarily, probably crossing uh, too far and what I should have been saying as an oh. assistant. I know that well. (laughs) But that also started showing me 
that, yeah, I need to be doing this then and I'll do it well. Now, was it an easy transition? No. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. And that's something I remembered my early years, you know, learning very quickly when the work came in. It just started coming to me when I made the choice that this is what I'm going to do. And it was like a whole nother bag of worms to figure out getting getting it all solid, you know, and yeah, that's very similar to where I came from, except that that my I hated my very last full time job. I was there for about six months. I quit right before I think I was going to get fired. I absolutely hated it. And just out of anger, I went into self-employment and it was the best decision I ever made. And it puts everything together for me that why I hated working for other people for as many years as I did. And I never really understood why I hated it. And the day I went into self-employment, I understood. It was yeah. so, it was so obvious that it was just a natural place for me to be. And I think that's the same with you in some ways. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, yeah, it's that everything you, you get to curate your lifestyle. Now, is it easy? No, being your own boss, not at all. I mean, it's one of the hardest things I've done or am doing. And, uh, you know, 17 years in, uh, it's going well. But the first 12 were a lot of growth, like a lot of figuring it out, a lot of figuring out the money, which brings me into yeah. meeting you. And like, but just, just the past five years finally feel like they're smoothing out and coming and I finally come into my own, but it's taken me that long to really get to a, a comfortable place just from all the learning lessons of running your own business. Yeah. yeah and, and that was really the same with me as well. I mean, when I started, I think I, I, I actually didn't have any bookkeeping clients. I had a couple of of uh i had like one training client that i got from a a a, cl a um a class that i was teaching back in 1995 and then the teaching kind of got almost to be a full-time thing which i explained in one of the other episodes about how i got into self-employment i kind of stumbled into lots of different things but it took a number of years for me to build up to the point where I couldn't work out of my living room anymore. I had to get an office outside and it was a red letter day, but I, I remember how nervous I was. How many times I said to myself, I'm moving everything from my living room into a real office. And what happens if I lose clients or if people leave me or what do I do then? And my wife said, well, you move everything back home. And I said, I really, you know what, what that would do to my ego? So oh, luckily, yeah. it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I constantly have an overflow of work with people I can't even get to. So, you know, you, you and I kind of have similar stories in a way because you have so much work that you actually don't say yes to everything anymore, yeah. which is a great, <laughs> great position to be in. It's, you know, I mean, really it's, nice. It's very, it feels good. But it's like, yeah, I still... I'd say 92% say yes to everything. <laughs> oh, okay. But you do, but, but you do know that you don't have to say yes. Exactly. I mean, that it's a very powerful position to, to know that you're making enough money to, to travel and to do things that you want to do, but yeah. you don't have to say yes to every single job that comes your way. It's a, it's the best feeling that I, that I have ever had. It's nice yeah. to be in demand because it's also good, you know, you, People know that you are very good at, at what you do, and that's um, that's a good thing. That's why you and I can um, commiserate a lot and relate a lot is because we both put 150% into everything, and I think that's absolutely the absolute key into starting a business is keeping the focus uh, and putting your all into it. And sometimes, you know, it can take a mental toll. It has on me many, many, many times throughout the years. To the point I wanted to throw it all away. And you, I mean, that's, you've heard me. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. you know, and yeah. finally I've gotten a place where I actually I enjoy it. It's like, I'm, I enjoy what I have, but it's taken years to get it all smooth, get it running itself, get it, you know, it's taken me years to come down from, you know, the, the, so many, so many layers of what goes into all this, you know, the manic modes, the, you know, taking care of all the paperwork, the money, and just balancing it all out. 
balance is still a hard thing for me. <laughs> well, I think it's run a uh, well looking at all the bookkeeping that I do for different people. I agree with you. I think that's a very common theme is balancing the the whole finance stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, like like running personal expenses through the company and not being able to separate it because you're not used to doing that. Uh, you do a great job with that, but so many of my other clients don't. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a very common theme is being a business owner and having that financial balance between the two is a yeah. big, you know, is a big uh, issue for a lot of people. Tell the listeners of this of this podcast about how we met. I know you took a class with me, a bookkeeping class with QuickBooks, and you wanted me to train your bookkeeper in specific job costing things. That's kind of how we met. But do you remember kind of how we how I became your bookkeeper? Tell people about that. Well, yeah. So I had a studio manager at the time slash friend, because that's what a lot of things that happened in the early years, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that's I think that's totally normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she was learning, supposedly, you know, we were getting where we're getting so many jobs, so much money was starting to go through that I it was getting overwhelming. And so yeah, we took a class with you. I'm, to my understanding, I'm working so much with just trying to keep the job flows. And all the other thing, assistance and everything else running on one side that I was thinking that she understood and knew what was going on with the bookkeeping side. I didn't know enough about it. That's why we took the class. I figured she was understanding and then come to find out tax season rolled around and nothing was done. Nothing was done correctly in the books. And so, yes, I called you panicking because I am not somebody who wants any monetary problems and I keep all my receipts and I like things buttoned up clean. Um, and you pulled us out of the uh, depths of that. And I had to move on from her. And then <laughs> we, uh, we moved forward with clean books and you helped, you helped me just bring it all to another level. Thank goodness. And yeah, it it was not fun getting there. I remember that that the, the the books that that were created by this person were really so inaccurate. I tried for hours and hours to try to fix it to use that same database to get accurate books so it matches with incoming 1099s and paperwork coming in, and I just couldn't do it. And I figured out that I needed to start a brand new database for you. And that was, you know, that was not, um, that wasn't fun because I had to redo everything in a very short period of time after the accountant who I set you up with. And I still feel, feel really bad about that. Um, the accountant who I set you up with, um, filed the tax return with the revenue was a different number, was a lower number than what your incoming 1099 was. And that caused a whole, you know, it caused a letter from the IRS and they gave us 30 days to get a set of books that they can work with. And that 30 days was extended to 60 days. And then I think it went to 90 days. And I remember I worked so hard in redoing your books. And that was the shaky beginning of our relationship. But once that was done and we had a totally new database, everything has been very smooth ever since then. And it's been, what, eight or nine years? Something like that. I even think in the 10 at this point. I swear it's been a long time. It's not longer because the years are flying. <laughs> but yeah, you, <laughs> I'm forever grateful. And your bookkeeping is it just it took everything to a new level to the point that I feel so comfortable now with the amount of every anything can come my way, knowing I have you in the back uh, helping out. And um, yeah, that was a rough that was a rough period. Yet yeah. one of the major growth spurts of uh, starting a business, and that's something I always tell anybody: if you're starting a business. If anything, get a good bookkeeper. Number one, first thing, don't even like hold back. And of course, I always recommend you. You just can't take all the work I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank you for that. But no, I, I usually tell business owners to, to, to do their own books for a couple of months. Even though you're making a lot of mistakes, do the, your own books so that you can 
you can um, you then get together with a bookkeeper who will correct all of the mistakes. The more you know about it, the better you can read profit and loss reports and balance sheet reports. So I'm all for any new small business owners, any startups should try to do their own bookkeeping. But before it becomes official, you should sit down with a bookkeeper who you hire eventually and have that bookkeeper really fix things the way they should be, but sit down with you. And that's exactly kind of what I mean, because it's like sometimes I feel like and this is this is how it happened with me with starting a business. It wasn't just one day. It's like, OK, boom, here we go. Like I said, it kind of like it just starts happening, which that's you know, some people do sit down and the next day they want to have they're going to have their business. And uh, but yeah, I think um, I yeah, I was using I mean, I was doing all my paperwork in a spiral notepad for years before I met you. You know, I had spiral notebooks all over the place, <laughs> very organized spiral notebooks with my ruler and graphs and all that. But yeah, it's uh, it's such a difference having somebody who knows what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember those early days where you would give your old accountant paperwork that, that you know, you, you put the revenue and you put the expenses and you had like, w- what, two or three sheets of paper that you gave him and you, you didn't even give him the stuff from QuickBooks. Yeah. And that's just, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure it was pretty accurate knowing you. But uh, because I'm sure you, you you know, you're in, in a much more control of your numbers than a lot of other clients are. But still, I mean, if, if not being able to look at a set of books and trust those sets of books, yeah. that's important. And I think we have it to the point where when, when we go and sit down for dinner a couple of times a year and we go over the, the profit loss, we know that the, that the numbers are really correct. Yeah. And that's the whole point of books. Exactly. Exactly. Makes me uh, sleep well at night. I tell you that much. <laughs> well, that's the idea. I mean, I've always thought that of uh, that a good bookkeeper and a good accountant should be part of a team, but at the same time, you we, you shouldn't have a whole lot of of phone calls or emails with them because you have a business to run, you know, yeah. and we can do everything. And if we have a question, I reach out to you or one of my assistants reaches out to you but you know we don't we don't talk every day because i don't want to bother you i mean you have a business to run and you're on sets and you know you're working hard so when things come up when we don't know what category to put something in or you know we're not sure what you purchase with that money we will reach out and ask you or if you get a piece of paperwork from the irs you'll reach out and ask us that's the way it should be it shouldn't be you know i want to be part of your team but i also don't want to I don't want to be a bother. You know, I should be behind the scenes doing my thing when you're running your own business. That's the idea for me. We work well together. That's what I like. (laughs) So, Yeah. And I don't want to talk about this very much, but I know the first accountant who I set you up with, it was just after about six months in the first tax return that that he did for you, there was instant non-chemistry. He waited till the very last minute literally the last minute. I mean, I think it was 12, it was 11 to 56 on April 15 uh, that he was putting your tax return through. And that just is not the way you wanted it to be done. And this is something that I've preached in other episodes of the of the podcast that you need to find an accountant that not only is good um, and knows what they're doing or, or a CPA, but also someone who matches your personality. And I think the person who we have now is much more laid back. And I recommended another person. And I, 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 how many years has it been that you've had Bob though? Oh gosh, it has to have been at least, I'd say seven, eight years. Really? Is that long? Okay. My oh yeah, right, family. right. With, with only after a, a, like the first year. Yeah. With the other person. Well, yeah. Maybe longer. Okay. I mean, it's like, no. it's amazing because time's going so fast. But I remember when he came over for a meeting it was so cute. He actually brought me, I think, cookies or something. And I yes, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't yeah. have my office built at the time, so that's how long ago I can remember. Like, yeah, how the studio has changed, and now I don't even have that studio. But yeah, it's like right. the times years are flying. But yeah, it's been a while. We I feel like it's such a good trio between the three of us, and he's great too because I can call him with questions. I had to about something last week. And, you know, he helps me out with things, too, which are just great. Yeah. So 
Yeah, he's a very laid back guy. And I I have several clients who, who I work with him with. And he is just, he always gets back to me and not only me, but his clients as well. I don't think he can let 24 hours go by without returning a phone call. Oh, no. voice uh, You know, that's really, really good. And so many other accountants in the New York area, you can wait for days to get a yeah, response. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's how I run my business, too. It's like if somebody reaches out to me for a job or, you know, inquiry, it's very rare. You'll, you know, you'll go half a day without hearing from me because it's just like to me, that's the importance of keeping the flow, you know, keeping the rapport with people, keeping you know, Absolutely. people know you're reliable, you know, and which also means even if you're not available, reliable to get back. It's just such a key proponent, I think, in being a small business owner. Yeah, that. well, it's all part of having that team. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you really don't need an in-house accountant or an in-house bookkeeper if both of them are available. Yeah. And you need them. I feel, that's that's what I try try to do. I know my phone that my my cell phone does not go off uh, after five o'clock uh, yeah. at night. And when I'm home, my office phone I have an extension of my office phone at home. And if it rings at nine o'clock at night, I will pick it up. I can't let it ring. Yeah, you know. And that's the way you know uh, the 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 better accountants are. You know, if they're in the office or if they're near a phone, they're not going to just let it ring. But there are accountants who after five o'clock at night, that's it. Yeah. You know, that's not what a small business person needs. The bigger multi-million dollar companies, maybe, sure. because they may be on that nine to five schedule. But us right. smaller businesses, no, we, we need someone who's there when we want them. Yeah, exactly. You know, so that's what I that's what I try to do for, for you. The last two questions that I have for you, they're interrelated. The first one is, what do you like the most about being a small business owner? Yeah, there's so many things. I mean, one is, again, kind of like I used the word curate before. You can kind of curate how you want to run your business. You know, uh, you can bring in the crew you want. You know, everyone, it's all relationships, all seeing how you work with people. Um, right. Uh, my clients as well, you know, some, if there's clients that we just don't really mesh so well, which is rare, I, I feel fortunate to say in my position, but you know, sometimes you can put up or shut up kind of thing, but it's just like, I like to, the fact that I can kind of choose my daily way of living, you know, with, you know, how much work I want to take on, what kind of people I want to bring in and keep around. So right. it's really, I feel so fortunate to be able to have those choices, you know, and also I do a creative job. So it's like, I can, I can push myself when I want to get more creative stuff or pull back when I just want to work and take the jobs that come in, you know? So that's great. And also the fact that, yeah, like, like recently I'm really figuring out my, uh, the path I want in life and it's, I'm able to go away when I want and come back when I want and keep my work the way that I want. That's got to be the best part of this is just, and, and also I want to say the amount of people you meet. That's the thing I love about, uh, yes. freelancing in the photo industry and also New York City, it's a huge market, huge amount of people, but yet it is very small. So it's like you have to, there's also a small world throughout this whole country. Yeah. There's so many things I feel so grateful for to have as running, running a business, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, I think in this city, in New York, um, everything you do is marketing yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, exactly. I mean, you don't know who you're going to meet. Exactly. You know, every person who you look at could be a potential client. Right. Right. I mean, I get calls like the other day, I got a call from someone who had shot at my, who had photographed something or no, he worked as an assistant to my photographer friend in my own studio space when it was kind of also a mm -hmm. shooting space. And he hit me up for um, uh, a dress company. And oh. I honestly, I don't remember him. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> you know, but now he's working at a company. And unfortunately, I couldn't do the job. But that's just exactly it. He was an assistant at one point. Now he's at a company. He must have, he remembered me and what I do. And it's like, and that's, 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 it's a fun cycle to see all these years, the amount of, yeah, the amount of people you meet and like, yeah. good and bad. But you know, and then where right. does it take you? So it's always like, it's like every week is kind of a new unknown path that right. I've, I've grown into a person to be able to, not only with my job, uh, be able to fly at the seat, my, seat of my pants to figure it out, 
right. also with people too. It's just, there's so many factors of being freelance, freelance in New York, running my own show. It's the more I talk about it, I'm kind of like, I'm really, really excited that I have this career. <laughs> I, you talked yeah. to me many years ago. I was not, but yes, I am. It's, it's in such a good place right now. So it's, uh, it's taken years, but yeah, it's, it's something I want your listeners to know. It has taken years. It doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't happen overnight, and it takes a lot of work to get there, too. A lot of work. A lot of but work. after a while, if you do it right, it almost becomes a turnkey operation in, exactly. in a lot of ways. I mean, and in such a our world right now of instant everything, from Instagram to instant gratification to everything, one thing that I still hardcore believe is the act of hard work it takes hard work and if you're in new york city especially or any big market it takes a lot of hard work and it does not happen instantly and that's something that's I right think a lot and of the young generation needs to understand you know it's yep and that's what they mean by if you if you make it in new york you can make it anywhere and it really is true but yeah. new york is one of the toughest places to to be to to be self-employed and to be able to make it, make a name for yourself and be in demand, you know, you can go anywhere and you can do the same thing. Yep. You know, so it's a good here. feeling. I hate to paint that picture, but it does take a lot of sweat and, it does. and tears. A- absolutely. <laughs> I have shed a lot of tears with this business. <laughs> I, we, we all do. We all do. It, it's, it's a lot of stress, but it's different. It's better stress than working for someone else and not having any control of it. Exactly. At least you have you have some control of your own stress. Exactly. You know, exactly. this situation's different. On the other hand, before we end, um, what is the the worst part for you about being a business owner? Well, one thing that you do know is the paperwork that comes behind all this from Yep. <laughs> I don't like it either, but hey. Yeah. <laughs> Invoices I can handle because I do all my I don't have a studio manager now, so I'm handling it. In fact, today I have to go and finish that up. But it's more just, yeah, the legalities behind things. I personally, I'm just not good with that. A lot of people have the mindset for that. I do not. That's why having you and Bob uh, in my back pocket are just so great to be able to fall back on and ask questions. Because sometimes to me, I literally can read Greek better than I can understand this paperwork in English. Yep. So, <laughs> but um, Yeah, Bob usually kind of tells you just kind of what to pay and how much to pay it and who to make the check out to and, and what you're paying and to write it in the, in the memo of the check. But, right. the, you know, it, that's all you really need to know. I mean, you don't, you know, okay. as long as you trust me, who you obviously do, and you trust Bob, the CPA, you know, that's all you really need to know. You don't have to fret over that. Exactly. But uh, but most business owners, I mean, that's such a common theme. The paperwork sometimes is overwhelming. Right, right. But yeah. you just want to run your own business. You know, that's a full-time job right there. Exactly. It's like the paperwork. And then the other thing about freelancing, and I don't experience this so much now. I used to more in the past, but it was the pay. And the photo industry in New York does not have a union. And you're right. kind of on your own. So that's something that if people enter this industry, I can just, I know it very well. I've been in it for almost going on almost 25 years and from assisting to running my own business. And it's just like, there's no, you really have to be careful on who you work with. So like, you know, who you're signing up with, because it, it, it's a little bit of this like throw papers to the wind mentality. And uh, you might get paid and sometimes you don't. And I just actually, I just spoke with a photographer who is having issues with getting paid. And so there's things with that, that it's, it's, I'm not nervous about it, but it can be nerve wracking if things go poorly. I've had a couple of situations where I wasn't going to get paid. We did, but it's very scary because you put so much work and effort into it. So those are the things yeah. with this industry. Like now my clientele, I pretty much know everybody. I'm friends with everybody. It's gotten to that point. Once in a while, you get the new person. You don't know. You don't know how it's going to be. Yeah. Well, I think that's true with 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 not just your industry, but you know, it's true with me as well. Yeah. Exactly. You know, uh, I mean, I, there's a couple of people who I know who actually charge um, before they do any work. They yeah. charge a retainer, and, and then they they they're guaranteed their money, and then it reverses the situation. But in what I do and, and what you do, you can't really do that. I mean, partly you can. You can get a deposit because you're laying out money of yeah, you know your I own do. money. Right. Yeah. So you can you can do that. But actually your fee you always get later. 
And I think that's true with any self-employed person where you're not guaranteed to get paid. I mean, there are laws and there are things that you can do to get paid, but sometimes you just have to wait for it if someone else is suffering. Uh, right. Sometimes you're not even going to get it. I mean, in rare occasions, you're not going to, you know, you're just going to eat it. And that's yeah. one of the bad things about being in self-employment yeah. is that you're not really guaranteed. Accounts receivable is not your friend. Yeah. You know, uh, you're looking at how much money you're owed and what do you have to do to get it? And also something, and I experience this a lot, is there's times it's hard to see the savings exist because, or go up because it's constantly feeding itself because I get paid so much later. So I have to keep my yeah. empl- my assistants and freelancers happy. The more I pay them on time, the more they're going to work with me. You know, I recently had a thing where you're supposed to, I guess, pay within 30 days in New York State. This is kind of new. It's, I guess I've learned since 2017. I won't get into all that, but basically, yeah, my clients don't all go by that, you know? Right. And also, how do you really enforce it? I mean, yes, it's a law, but number one, you you can't really enforce it. And number two, you can sue them. But if you sue them, you're going to blow the whole relationship and you'll never do another job for them. So it's between a rock and a hard place. Exactly. It's like, the per the assistant that came after me, thirty one days later, I uh, basically, you know, said, uh, "If you do this to everybody, if you threaten them, threaten to go after them, you're not going to work with anybody." So that's right. just how it's the nature of this business. So you really right. you have to. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a game. It's a bit of a dance. You got to keep good relationships. It's not all right or yeah. fair, yeah. but it's just how it goes. And you're either yeah. in it. Where you go get a regular job, right? <laughs> I mean, that's simple. the one. That's the one advantage of of having you know a W two you know regular employment yeah. you know job is every two weeks you get a paycheck. Yeah, you know, so it's steady money, and you can budget your your money. But especially in what you do, the amount of money that you outlay to yeah. buy props and to create props way before you get paid, it can literally be thousands and thousands of dollars of your own money. And if you don't get reimbursed for that, that could be a real problem. Yeah. And sometimes you do have to wait months to get to get reimbursed. Eventually, you know, you do. I don't think you've ever really gotten really royally. Um, uh, what no. word can I use? You know, yeah. but, but but it it does happen one once in a while that where we okay. just don't see that that money and you're out. You know. Well. And this could be a whole other podcast, but uh, is when I had agents. Having agents yes. were the worst thing for me because they would use my money to fund themselves and fund their things because yeah. I was working almost every day and not getting my advances. And there was no reason for that. Now, no agent on my own. Uh, I get all my advances and my I have no debt. And to be a set designer, again, and I'll say it again, and work as much as I do in this city <laughs> and not have debt for the first time in my life is, or for the past actually almost three years is almost probably unheard of because there's so much money that's just going around and I can actually pay yeah. off my debt. You know, it's like, uh, again, going back to when I assisted, there was a, a guy I assisted doing sets and he would use those money, that, the advanced money that he would get to go get his house in Fire Island. And then he was always broke. And I remember seeing that being like, hmm, I don't think that's right. So that was one of my lessons learned. You get your advance, you pay your credit card. End of story. Life is good. <laughs> it really but, is about managing money. I mean, I, I there are yeah. there are, are clients who, who I have had in the past where they collect money and their commission is supposed to be 10 or 15, 20%. And then 80% or 75% goes out to the talent. Uh, so you would think that if, you know, $10,000 comes in, then they would keep 2500 and 7500 would go out to who they owe. It it doesn't work that way. They end up keeping the 10000 and three months later, you know, then they pay it to the town. And you're not really supposed to do that. I mean, there's you, there's a fiduciary understanding where if your agency collects money on your behalf, they're supposed to pay you. Yeah. 
But again, how do you enforce that? Yeah, so that's a whole other thing about being self-employed. Like I said, that's a whole other podcast we should do. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole yeah. other conversation. And I can probably have a ton of people who can talk about that too. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what makes your you know, and, and I mean that's why lawyers charge retainers before they do anything, before yeah. they pick up a phone. You got to pay them five five grand, you know, yeah. or two grand, or whatever whatever it is, and then they keep track of what they do. In your industry, you know, I mean, sometimes you can get that, sometimes you can't. Yeah. And if you insist on getting it, you, you're going to lose jobs if they don't. It, it's a very tough business to, to be in. But you have really, you've made it much, much, much smoother. Oh, and your you. lifestyle has gone up, too. <laughs> it which has. is great. I mean, you're able to travel. You, you have money in the bank. You know, you have an IRA. You have a SEP. So, I mean, that that's the way you should be doing it. And and I, I hope, you know, I feel as though I'm part of that team to get Absolutely you there. Absolutely, Marvel. <laughs> so, no joke. And, yeah, it, it, yeah. and it makes me sleep at night, too. You know, it lets me sleep. Yeah, I could not. And that's important to me. Point on my own. There's no way. I mean, it's like I don't I don't know enough about the back end of it to keep things organized without a spiral notepad. So, <laughs> I needed you, and I'm so glad. Yeah, you. and and now I'll tell you, you're one you're of my, my easiest. Well, and I feel that way about you. You're actually one of my easiest clients to do bookkeeping on, Thank because you. since this setup is is 100 percent right and the way we want it, it and you have the pattern every single month. It's like the same people, you know, yeah. pretty much. I mean, we occasionally a new assistant or something, but you know, when a new W nine comes in, but you are very straightforward now. Yeah. So it's really it, it's it's very easy bookkeeping because it's it's all based on patterns. And that's why your books are ready to go. And, you know, by February 1st, they're usually re- ready to go right after yeah. we get the 1099s out. Yeah. So you're not going to have that problem. No more. You left the 59 on April 15th. That's for sure. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That first year was really a nightmare. That was rough. <laughs> you know. Thank you to Sarah Foldenauer from Sets by Sarah LLC for joining me today for my very first interview. If you want to see her website to see exactly what she does, go to www.setsbysarah.com and take a look. I would really love to hear from all of you with your thoughts, ideas, or general comments about this podcast. Remember, the email address is bookkeepermensch at gmail.com or the website at www.bookkeepermensch.com and leave me voicemail by scrolling down a bit on the homepage. We are growing in leaps and bounds and I really do appreciate all of you who have discovered the podcast and come back every two weeks when episodes are made available. Very soon, I'll be starting very short episodes with quick business tips on the weeks that no regular episode is uploaded, so be looking for that. Until then, thanks once again for listening. I'm Paul Rosenberg.